Hello, I'm Penny Peterson, and I'm Head of Outreach Services at the Orion Township Public Library. In 1985, Orion Township celebrated its 150th year. The township formed in 1835, and we wanted something for our, uh, the sesquicentennial celebration, because we were going to have a time capsule. Now, prior to this, I first began taking classes in cable in 1980. And then I took a year uh, at OCC, also studying cable. But we didn't have cable in Orion Township, nor did they think that we would be able to have cable because we had too many lakes and we wouldn't get reception. But the library went on and on, and so we did put together the slide presentation. I wrote a script, and there was a gentleman that came to the library that had a very good voice, speaking voice, and I asked him if he would read the script. And we, so we put the slides together. We got music from the Northeast Oakland uh, Museum up in Oxford, original music. We put that as a background. But my son and I went down to Tribune United Cable, down in Royal Oak. And we put, made the slide presentation, put it on uh, film. We didn't know whether it would gonna, was going to be on or VHS. But we put this together, you know, make into film. Then I took it to, uh, we had a little studio in Clarkston, and we put this all together. And if you notice that all of the credits are handwritten, the um, picture of the dragon is hand drawn by one of our students at the library. Anyway, this was to tell a brief in history of Orion in 30 minutes presentation of Orion Township's history was contributed by the Orion Township Public Library in honor of our sesquicentennial celebration. The pictures were collected from the Orion area senior citizens and compiled and converted to slides by Patricia Warfield, the outreach librarian at the time. The text was written by Penny Peterson and narrated by Earl Miller, an Orion Township resident. It was then recorded by Tribune United Cable Communications on VHS video cassette tape. You're about to see our very first tape that we made, and I hope you enjoy it. And everyone, everyone should know that this, we had such a varied and unique history, and I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. Thank you. Welcome to the Charter Township of Orion's sesquicentennial celebration. Let us celebrate by taking a look at Orion's glorious and interesting past. You could say that a traveling auctioneer named James Stilson was one of the founders of Orion. You couldn't say it too proudly because Stilson was a swindler. He bought 40 acres of land at $1.25 an acre, divided this land into lots and sold them to eastern investors at exorbitant prices. Stilson's promotional brochure illustrated steamboats and wharves on the lake, stores, fine graded roads, and a busy community life in his mythical village of New Canandaigua. After traveling weeks to see their property, the gullible victims found marshland in the middle of nothing and went back home. Stilson unloaded the remaining lots with great haste in Detroit, where the last of the lots were auctioned off for as little as six cents each. Since civil records did not record a local hanging at that time, it may be safe to assume that Stilson had moved on. Then came the pioneers whom we can justifiably brag about. Needham Hemingway, Moses Munson, Paul Carpenter, Jesse Decker, credited with first giving the name of Orion to the area, John Wetmore, Judah Church, Philip and John Bigler, and John McAlvory. In 1824 to 1828, these early settlers had an idea. Build a dam to unite several lakes in the area into one large body of water, and then build a sawmill. They carried out their plan, but the mill was burned by the Indians. The mill was rebuilt, but the dam, which was built across Paint Creek, Lake Orion's outlet, broke. In a remarkable example of cooperation, 
community members got together at dawn and worked until the dam was completed. The dam raised the level of the lake and formed many islands. Available records indicate that the first public land purchased in Orion Township was in 1819. This purchase is supposed to have been made because Orion had one of the finest stands of pine in southern Michigan. The first Orion sawmill was built by Samuel Munson in the summer of 1825 on the Decker settlement, now known as the Bald Mountain Recreation Area. In the fall of 1825, Joseph Jackson's mill on Paint Creek operation. Hemingway, Decker, and Bigler built an 1829 sawmill below the present dam on Orion Lake. In 1835, Thomas Drake built a steam sawmill in the Pinery Woods, which became the settlement of Steam Mill, later known as Mahopac. Rudd's Mill, owned by Paul Carpenter, was located near the spring on Clarkston Road. The person who built a mill in an area was often responsible for attracting people to a site and getting a town started. Jesse Decker, one of the founding settlers, became the token leader of these families. Following legislative approval of Orion Township in March, the first township meeting was held April 5, 1835. The meeting, held in the home of Decker, awarded him the position of township supervisor at a salary of $2 per year. Just as mills were necessary, so were farms, churches, taverns, and schools. Education consisted of children taking instruction in the living room of one Samuel Eaton. By 1827, the Decker Settlement children attended a newly built log schoolhouse. In 1834, a crude log cabin on the southeast corner of Scripps and Lapeer Road was built and became known as Clark Corners School. In 1844, in the village, a small two-story school was built on the northeast corner of Church and Anderson Streets. This structure still stands and is now a residence. One of Lake Orion's first school teachers, a Mr. Dalby, had no legs and walked about on his hands. He always wore a long black cape in a futile attempt to hide his handicap. He was often referred to as Spider-Man. The township was divided into four school districts in 1836, with log schoolhouses in each of the four quarters. By 1838, nine schools were functioning. The schools were known as Block, Clark, Decker, Haworth, Mahopak, Newman, Shanghai, Proper, and another on Walden Road near Joslin Road. The Carpenter family was prominent in township history. There were five Carpenter brothers settled here. They donated land on which the Carpenter School was built. Lottie Proper's family donated the land for Proper School, which is now located in Gingelville. Proper School continued to function as a school until the early 1980s. There were 15 female and 6 male teachers in the township, as well as 12 books in the Mahopak School Library. You can see by the expressions on the children's faces that they posed for pictures, much as kids do today. Scripps School, located near Joslin and Walden Roads, was built jointly by the Scripps family and public funds in the early 1900s. It was constructed for his workers' children and other children in the area. Scripps did not want to be responsible for providing transportation for the children, so he sold the school to the church. St. Mary's Episcopal Church is still at the same location today with additions to the old school. Mr. Westcott was superintendent of schools in 1910. He and his wife were standing outside of the high school, which was one of the first brick schools built in Orion. It was replaced in 1927 by this school located on Elizabeth Street in the village. It is presently the community education building. Apparently, the high school pupils were receiving a good formal education. Extracurricular activities such as football became popular. Notice the O's sewn on the blankets. The girls hand sewed the O's so that everyone could identify the Orion team. It was also the pre-helmet era. Just look at the size of the 1921 graduating class. 
Lake Orion Band in the early 1940s with James Basco as director, taken at the high school on Elizabeth Street. Blanche Sims School was built in 1950 and is located on Jackson Street in the village. This is Miss Blanche Sims with the last class she taught before she retired. Today, there are nine schools in the township with approximately 5,500 students enrolled. In 1834, John Hankinson opened his store in Decker Settlement. By 1836, Jesse Decker's tavern obtained town board approval. In 1832, Rufus Streeter established a blacksmith shop at Decker Settlement. Here, Abe Deer, a blacksmith of the 1860s, stands in front of his shop on what is now Broadway. Around 1837, Dr. Smead came as Orion's first physician. Dr. Bug joined him a year later. L.L. Treat was the first practicing lawyer. This picture of Main Street shows the doctor's office on the left, and the two-story building on the right was the original home of the Orion Review. The Orion Review was established in 1881 by Mr. and Mrs. Neal and is still in existence today. Here, Old Mac stands in front of the printing press. Orion was incorporated as a village in 1859, but the charter was repealed in 1863 after nearly all the village burned in the fire of 1862. Rebuilding was completed and it was again chartered in 1869. Formerly, the village was called Orion, but it was generally known as Dogway, a tough, hard-drinking, crazy town full of saloons and roughnecks ready for a fight with or without a cause. Three times in its history, in 1862, 1874, and 1894, Lake Orion has been destroyed by fire, and three times it has been rebuilt. The boom period began with the arrival of the Iron Horse in Orion in 1872. Thanks to the efforts of one of the directors of the Michigan Central Railroad, the company's original plans to route tracks through Romeo and Fish Lake were changed and Orion's importance grew. Charles K. Carpenter, a prominent Orion citizen, was that director and his foresight was soon rewarded. Building a railroad through the village was not without its dangers though. E. R. Emmons, who owned a mill on the site of the present Instiprint in the village, was dead set against a railroad passing in front of his business. To prove his point, he announced that the village cannon, a remnant of the Civil War, was now residing in a second floor window of the mill, and anyone attempting to lay track within 100 feet of the building would wish he hadn't. The fact that the cannon had mysteriously vanished from its usual place of rest added to the buzzing of township residents. Working through one evening, the railroad workers labored to lay rails out of range of the cannon. Several citizens, finding the missing cannon buried south of the mill, fired it off at 12.10 the following day. The supposed cannon turned out to be an old stovepipe painted red. The trolley that ran from Detroit to Flint began in 1900 and ended in 1931. The fare from Detroit to Flint was less than 50 cents. With the coming of the railroad, enterprising people who had never before considered Lake Orion as much of an asset now recognized the excursion and resort possibilities. Detroiters could now travel to Orion quickly and cheaply by train. During 1874, a group of prominent citizens purchased Island Park, now known as Park Island. To provide access from the mainland to the island, they built a substantial bridge. On the island, they constructed a reception hall and dance hall 100 feet long with a tower 80 feet high. From the tower, paying guests could get an impressive view of the lake. This same group of Orion promoters later purchased the Little Dick steamer and built wharves and docks, not too unlike those envisioned by James Stilson 40 years earlier. 
excursion trips to the Lake Orion Islands and other points of interest soon became popular with the Gay Blades and Bells from Detroit. Many picnics were now being held in Orion, with free use of the island being granted to the resorters and local churches. There were even special trains to accommodate the thousands coming from Detroit for the celebrations on Decoration Day, the 4th of July, and Barbecue Day. For these especially well-attended days, the governor often came to tell the crowd of his statewide achievements. The spiritualists were among those early excursionists, and they camped on Island Park each year. Rental cottages and summer homes sprung up all around the lake. To oblige the tourist trade, businesses such as Bergman's Bakery made early morning deliveries to Island Park. Walter Bergman is shown here with faithful old Barney who became well known by the locals and resorters alike. The gay 90s would find Orion's potential come to full flower. It began with the purchase of Spencer's Island, now known as Bellevue Island, by the recently formed Orion Improvement Company, composed mostly of Detroiters. They proceeded to erect half of what was the Bellevue Hotel, as well as selling some lots and cottages. Promotional brochures described the hotel as delightfully situated overlooking the water, the only hotel facing Lake Orion. Surrounded with spacious grounds, all outside rooms are modern to the minute. A large screened porch dining room featured pure, cold drinking water with fish, frog, and chicken dinners a specialty. Advertised rates were $4 a day and up. In 1898, the Reverends John Sweet, J.T. Haller, and others set about organizing the Assembly Resort Association, which purchased Bellevue Island from the Orion Improvement Company. They built a bridge to the island, constructed a road on its south side, and built an auditorium for 2,250 people. It was now possible for tourists to take the train from Detroit to Lake Orion, disembark at Greens Park, catch the Anna B, and land at Bellevue Island for a weekend of relaxation. After all, Lake Orion was advertised as a summer paradise, free from heat, noise, and smoke, filling every requirement for a perfect vacation away from toil and turmoil. The double-deck boat, City of Orion, was purchased in 1901. Bands played on the upper deck where the dance floor was located. Music provided by Butler's band drifted from the upper deck as the boat sailed to the smaller docks on Lake Orion's many islands. The boat wasn't big enough to carry the amount of people they picked up at the dock, and there wasn't too much room on the top deck to dance. Ragtime, two-step, square dancing, and waltzes livened the spirits of the festivity. Excursion rides cost about 10 cents, and at the end of the day, the band divided up what the crowd had paid. One could hear the band from noon until 10 p.m. every day. On moonlight nights, Grinnell's Music House advertised Hawaiian ukulele music. A Hawaiian couple would float by in a canoe, singing. Orion became known as the Chautauqua of Lower Michigan. Orion succeeded in drawing well-known speakers, including William Jennings Bryan, who gave his famous Cross of Gold lecture. The Orion Chautauqua offered courses such as dramatic speaking, theater, music, and business. Diplomas were often given to people who had completed the summer school programs sponsored by the Chautauqua. Here, the Michigan Baptist Assembly, held in 1904, was a denominational affair and lacked in many of the features that make up the program of other assemblies. The morning hours consisted of Bible study, lectures, and missionary addresses. Musical entertainment took place during the afternoon and evening hours. The Orion Light and Power Company supplied light to the assembly grounds. Churches abounded throughout Orion. Here the Haworth Methodist Church, built in 1859 and located on Silver Bell and Bald Mountain Roads, celebrates by having a picnic in 1910. The Methodist Church in the village was moved physically to its present location on Flint and Street streets. 
It was built in 1872 and had to be moved because it was too close to the railroad tracks. Every time a train passed, the danger of fire presented itself to the wooden church. Before this time, circuit riders visited homes in Orion. The community had its share of fame as a health resort as well. In 1884, Harold Emmons built a pagoda over the Orion Mineral Spring located on Kern Road near Clarkston Road. The claim was that the water benefited the kidneys and the liver. Dr. J. DeCoux and Dr. Charles DeCoux opened a cancer institute in 1889 in the village of Orion. The DeCoux Cancer Infirmary gained national recognition as a treatment center for the healing of cancers. The doctors had developed a salve whose cure seemed highly effective, though its ingredients were not divulged. Orion was established as a summer resort community by the turn of the century. In the winter, there was skating on the lakes, but for those with a more commercial interest, there was the ice business. Cutting blocks of ice from the lake, hauling the cakes to storage houses where they were buried in sawdust until summer, and selling the blocks for people to use in their ice boxes. One of our Orion residents, Bud Shar, used to work at the Pittman and Dean Ice Company. In the early morning, he would leave his family's home on Church Street and trudge through snow to Long Lake to do odd jobs for the ice house. The work was long, strenuous, old, but it was rewarding. At the end of the day, Shar would return home with $10 in his pocket. The ice houses for Pittman and Dean Company once stood where the Franklin Settlement Camp is located today on Long Lake. As trolley and train transportation declined in the mid-1920s and the electric refrigerator gained popularity, the ice companies began to close. Pittman and Dean Company didn't cut any ice after 1926. Today, the stone foundation of the ice house is still visible at Franklin Settlement. Speaking of transportation, automobiles were beginning to be seen more and more. Orion's main street, Broadway, was paved in 1919. Lapeer Road became a state trunk line in 1916 and was graveled. However, the conditions of the road in spring and winter soon made it almost impassable and the decision to pave it was reached in 1929. In 1911, Park Island was made into an amusement center with rides such as a merry-go-round and roller coaster. By 1912, Lake Orion was known as the Paris of the Detroit area, with Park Island, its Moulin Rouge, and the lake itself as well-traveled as the channel between England and France. The Park Island reception hall and dance hall were often filled to capacity. One could take a ride on the Thriller roller coaster, visit the Penny Arcade where for one penny you could watch the Hoochie Coochie, or enjoy a day of swimming. This group of bathing beauties have the correct attire for the early 1900s. Notice the knee socks and shoes. This water slide was one of the first in Michigan. It was made of wood and as it got older it got more and more splintery. Eventually it became a toboggan slide for winter fun. The Loch Ness Monster of Lake Orion made his debut in the spring of 1894 when two Orion ladies were fishing from a dock in Lake Orion. Everyone laughed at the women's story, but as the summer continued, several citizens of Orion sighted the monster, and as the story grew, so did the Orion Serpent. Descriptions varied between residents who said he was black with a head as large as a yearling calf, no ears were visible, but in their place was a pair of jet black horns. It had a slimy, scaly body and ranged in size from 30 to 80 feet in length, depending on the resident. The serpent's fame grew, and whenever a boat tipped in the lake or a cow or calf was missing, the accusing finger was pointed to Lake Orion's dragon. Although hunting parties with guns searched for the monster, it was never captured and forever remained in the depths of Lake Orion. Mrs. Gladys Van Wagner has given us the real story. A very young man who dearly loved jokes had the local blacksmith make up some rings of different sizes out of metal. 
Using his mother's sewing machine, he then covered the rings and hooked them up to a pulley system he devised between his boathouse and the island across from his house. Every time someone came near in a boat or swimming, he simply hid in the boathouse and pulled the pulleys. The dragon was about 20 feet long, and of course, the longer it stayed in the water, the more it looked like a monster. Some people didn't swim in Lake Orion for two or three years. Two subdivisions were developed in 1924 that would change the population image of Orion Township. The Jacob Schick Farm was sold to the newly formed Bunny Run Country Club and developed into a residential area. The Indian Wood Golf and Country Club was also established in 1924 and started developing homes as well as a fine golf course. James and Harriet Gingell started their family in a log cabin on Silver Bell Road in the late 1800s. Their sons and grandsons founded Gingellville as we know it today. Lake Orion's heyday as a resort town came to a dramatic close with the beginning of the Depression years, 1929 and 1930. Although the amusement rides and other facilities still existed on Park Island, the Chautauqua was gone from Orion's shores, largely due to the advent of radio. Since its beginning in the 1870s, one of the most popular features of the Chautauqua was bringing classical and vaudevillian music ensembles to rural America. But the advance of technology and the increasingly common use of electricity made radio an easier form of entertainment, and people didn't have to leave their homes. The ending of the Great Resort era was brought to a close when automobiles took Detroiters further away for vacations. The Interurban Railroad fell upon hard times, and since the Interurban Route had been a main source for vacationers for the small resorts, Orion's summer population dropped steadily. With the sharp decreases in both summer and winter-related jobs, Orionites were forced to look to other communities for employment, with the automobile and associated factories in Pontiac being a logical choice. The area still needed service-oriented businesses, and many new ones entered the Orion economy. Chains such as A&P and Kroger opened outlets, and the village also boasted three car dealerships. The Orion Township Library was founded in 1926 by the Lake Orion Women's Club. It moved to its present location on Lapeer Road in 1965. A branch library was opened in Gingelville in 1973. An attempt to revive the resort era was made in the mid-30s with the establishment of the Michigan Inland Lakes Festival of Lake Orion. The festival was short-lived, only lasting a few years. By the late 1940s, the transition from resort and agricultural status of the area to a suburban community had been completed. When the United States was drawn into World War II, Pontiac's factories shifted production to aid in the war effort, and many Orion residents were employed. Orion had become a focal point for people moving northward into the rural atmosphere, in such areas as Perry Acres and Judah Lake Subdivision. The 1960s found the Orion area molding its direction for the future. The advent of High Hill and Keatington subdivisions stimulated an even greater influx of people into the township. Between the township and the village, the 1970s brought apartments, condominiums, and mobile home parks. A fine park system has been set up, including state, county, and township parks, helping to preserve our rural and natural atmosphere. Orion, after 150 years, has grown from an area supporting about 20 families to approximately 23,000 people in 1980. Orion's colorful past has included pioneers, a land swindle, a mineral spring with water claiming to be beneficial to both kidneys and liver, a resort area where church assemblies competed for attention with an amusement park and a rumored sea serpent. Few areas can boast such a varied past. Many present Orion residents are directly descended from the hardy pioneers who settled here. Present day Orion is a mixture of the old and the new, conservative and progressive, fun and hard work. Today, year-round residents enjoy shopping, fine restaurants, modern financial institutions, and progressive civic organizations. 
Orion Township is also the home of the world's largest General Motors plant. The village and township are governed by dedicated people working for a bright and promising future. Let us not dim the lights.